Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We're physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. We're excited to welcome University of Chicago Provost Catherine Baker today. But first, we'd like to check in on current hot topics in health and health care. And Harlan, what's, what's top of mind for you today? Well, Howie, I, I was uh, very interested in this report that came out. It was from the Peterson and the Kaiser Family Foundation group that was really looking at life expectancy and, again, comparing it to cost. Look, this is the same old story you and I have talked about for a while, but this is really updated and, and with good information. And so in the U.S., they're describing a period where life expectancy continued to decline while rebounding in other comparable countries between 2020 and 2021. And this was, I think, the important thing about this report was that it was comparing us with other countries. And also that the life expectancy gap between men and women has widened more in the U.S. than in any other country. The U.S. gap increased to a 5.8 year difference in 2021, up from 5.1 in 2019. And in other countries, it's, you know, it's just a little more than four. So our life expectancy is dropping more than comparable countries. Our gap between men and women is enlarging and is, is, is maybe the largest among comparable countries. And, you know, we have the lowest life expectancy compared to other wealthy nations while spending, continuing to spend not even just a little bit more than these other countries, but, you know, 2x more than, than these countries, 3x more than Japan, who has the longest life expectancy. And, and all this to say one thing, because I want to get your view on this, but, you know, in, in 1980, as recently as 1980, life expectancy of birth in the U.S. and in other sort of comparably large and wealthy countries was, was pretty similar. So, you know, this wasn't like something that's always been in, in 1980, pretty close. And since then, there's been this separation, separation by life expectancy and separation on the other side by cost as we continue to outstrip the rest of the world. And, and I don't know how you look, you teach health policy, you're an expert in in, you know, what's going on in healthcare and healthcare spending, you tell me what's happening here. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I think there's a lot of things happening and I don't have all the answers at all, but, you know, for the last decades, we've always said that probably only about a third of the improvement in life expectancy over the last hundred years is due to health care, and that most of it is due to social determinants of health, public health, things like that, education, uh, sanitation, all those other measures. And I just wonder whether the same is true in reverse. Is it because of the excess gun violence in our country? Is it the excess of opioid deaths, which are dramatically higher in this country than most other countries in the world? Is it the higher levels of alcoholism uh, and other types of even motor vehicular trauma um, we're high on most of these measures compared to the other developed nations. Some of that is our libertarian nature of this country. But I wonder, like, how much of it comes down to that? Uh, it's not. It's not. In, there was another recent study that came out that was looking at this. Th those are contributing factors. But our major causes of death, cardiovascular disease, for example, continues to be a central reason that we're, we're different from everyone else. And so it's not just those things. But cardiovascular disease does rely on nutrition and, and exercise and livable and walkable communities. Oh, oh, oh for, for sure. I just meant like just taking accidents and homicides and, and you yeah, know, I'm, I'm adding them all up. I'm just saying oh, like, okay. there's a lot of things in there yeah. and very few of them. I mean, I, I, and look, I don't want to say that we shouldn't blame healthcare providers, but just as we've said that most health life expectancy improvements have not been due to health care, but due to other things. I, I think that we're spent, we spend so much time with the $4 trillion on health care. Uh, we're back to Betsy Bradley and Lauren Taylor's Health Care Paradox book. Like, we may be spending the money in the wrong category. Yeah, and I, I just wonder, you know, a lot of people want to argue that if we start decreasing or slowing spending, we're going to inhibit innovation. And I just ask, what is the innovation brought for us if at a population level, there's so much separation. I, I and agree. just to end this, I just want to be really clear about this, you know, because I mentioned this thing about like, you know, and, and you may think that Japan's not a proper comparison for us, but 
it just is like a remarkable thing that we spend per capita something like, you know, $12,000 on each person for life expectancy of 76.4. And in Japan, they're spending $4,000, $5,000 essentially for life expectancy of 84.5. I know. I know. It's striking. This is, look, these are the first slides in my class. These are the first slides in my class. And we spend a lot of time in class trying to tease out why it is. And nobody has great answers. It just So I'm going to, during this next interview, I'm going to ask our guest, uh, who's one of the foremost health policy people in the country, what her, what her solution is for health policy. So we'll see what she says. I look forward to it. Yeah, great. Catherine Baker is the provost of the University of Chicago and the Emmett Dedman Professor at the Harris School of Public Policy. She is a nationally recognized and highly accomplished health economist, and her research includes analyzing healthcare policy, public economics, and the effects of private and public health insurance. Before being named provost, she was the dean of the Harris School. She has also worked at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as the C. Boyden Gray Professor of Health Economics. Dr. Baker is internationally renowned for running the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, a large-scale study on the effect of healthcare outcomes and healthcare utilization in Oregon after its Medicaid expansion. In addition to her teaching and researching roles, Dr. Baker is a National Bureau of Economic Research Research Associate and serves on the board of several national health-related organizations, including Eli Lilly and as a trustee for the Mayo Clinic. She also holds several editorial and advisory positions, such as for JAMA Health Forum, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation and Health Affairs, and was a commissioner on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. She has served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and is on the Congressional Budget Office's panel of health advisors. She completed her BA in economics at Yale University almost exactly 30 years ago before pursuing a PhD in economics at Harvard. I want to first welcome you to the podcast and both Harlan and I know that you are much, much more than the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. <laughs> but, but it, it much more. But it is, much but more. it is a tremendous contribution to our understanding of so much. And I wonder if you could start off by just explaining to our audience why it was so important, and maybe some of the basics of how it was constructed. And then I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions and hand it off to Harlan. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And if I were known only for the Oregon health insurance experiment, I would feel pretty proud about that because it's, um, I think, I think one of the most important studies I've had the uh, opportunity to work on. And here's why. There are crucial questions in health policy that are still roiling the federal government and states today. What does it mean to cover people with public programs like Medicaid? What does it do to healthcare costs? What does it do for their health? What does it do to well-being overall? And these are foundational questions about programs that are more than 50 years old. So you'd think that we would know the answers. And it's not for lack of trying. It's that it's very hard to separate out the effect of insurance itself from all sorts of other things. So for example, if you wanted to know what the effect of being on Medicaid was for mortality, say you're a state considering covering more people in your state with Medicaid, how much would that change mortality rates? Well, you might start with a very naive comparison of looking at the mortality rate for people on Medicaid versus the uninsured. And you might discover that people on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate than the uninsured. Well, it would certainly not be the right conclusion to say, therefore, Medicaid is killing people. It's a terrible program and we should discontinue it. Rather, you have to understand why are some people on Medicaid and some people aren't. One of the ways you get on Medicaid is by being low income. That in and of itself is very hard on your health for lots of reasons. Another way you get on Medicaid is being disabled in and of itself a health challenge. So if you don't take those into account, you're going to get a very mistaken idea about the effect of your policy on your residents' well-being. So and quickly tell us, how is it that you structured this? I mean, how did this happen? What was the natural experiment that presented itself to you? The state of Oregon, before the ACA or Obamacare, had decided to expand Medicaid to all low-income adults. And I should say that I think it was surprising to a lot of people to learn around the ACA debate that most low-income adults who don't fall into a particular category 
are not eligible for any public insurance or weren't before that law change. Oregon was one of the states that had chosen to expand Medicaid beyond those mandatory categories of the disabled, pregnant women, low-income children, but they'd ran out, they ran out of money for their program and couldn't enroll new people until 2008, when because of attrition from the program and because of some new revenue sources, they had enough money to enroll 10,000 more people. And they decided the only fair way to do that would be through a lottery. They, they thought about lots of other mechanisms. You could say, what about first come, first serve? Well, that might advantage people who were better connected to the social safety net, who had more access to a computer, for example, and they didn't want to advantage those people over all of the others who might want to take up the program. So they held a lottery. They got a waiting list. They signed up 90,000 people on that waiting list, and then they drew names by chance, not because they were looking to set up the perfect natural experiment, although that is in essence what they did, but because they wanted to be fair to residents in Oregon. And just one last question before I hand it off to Harlan. There's an article in The Atlantic from 2013 that I think summarizes the discourse on your uh, study so well. And the title is, how to use the Oregon Medicaid study to your ideological advantage. And it is the best title I've ever seen. Can you give a couple of examples of, of how people use that study to their ideological advantage? I'm really glad you highlighted that because that's one of my favorites too. And I use it in a lot of slides when I present about Oregon because the answers that we got from the study were very nuanced. It was a, a mixed bag as any study of a multifaceted program with lots of different effects for lots of different people is likely to produce. So people who were in favor of expanding Medicaid could say, look, people are much um, happier when they have Medicaid, they have much lower debt, they're more likely to get access to care that they value, depression rates are much lower, self-reported health is much better. Look, it's a great program. On the other hand, people who were not in favor of expanding Medicaid could say, look, there were no effects found on physical health conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, and people spent a lot more on the program. Not only did they go to the doctor more, but they went to the emergency room more. And so the program cost a lot of money. And that's the reality of almost any public program. It comes with benefits to the people who are enrolled, and it comes at a cost to the taxpayers who have to finance it. And because those are often different people, it sets up a real political conundrum for policymakers. This is really, I think, you know, one of the best examples of studying public policy in a rigorous way. It's just extraordinary. And I, I think that the thing that really did surprise me about it was that, that there was no improvement in physical health. And you, you look for you know, two years after the lottery and, and tried to detect these changes. I mean, a lot of people who are promoting the idea of Medicaid expansion sort of have this assumption that, that you know, people are going to die if we don't expand Medicare. You know, we're going to save lives or we're going to vastly improve health. And your study, this Oregon Health Experiment, you and many others, you know, really failed to demonstrate that that was, that that was true. Now, it did show, like like you said, that there were, interestingly, there were more hospitalizations and more ED visits. Um, but but that also proves something, which is that increase in healthcare utilization, at least in the two year time frame, didn't translate into a meaningful benefit by physical health. It did raise the level of diabetes detection and management, and lower rates of depression, reduce financial strain. All those things are good. But, but mostly when you're thinking about the policy side, we're thinking about how to improve physical health. How did you sort of, as you thought about this, sort of piece this together? Because it, it sort of seems so important that people have this insurance coverage, but yet the coverage by itself, it didn't achieve that better physical health. Well, I, there are a couple of threads that I want to pull on in that great question. First of all, I don't want to downplay the improvement in depression. We saw a really marked improvement in depression where we screened people in in-person interviews and found a 30% or nine percentage point drop in depression. And this is a serious unmet health need 
of the population. So I, I wouldn't want to minimize the importance of that, nor of the financial well-being. There was a 25 percent drop in bills sent to collection. And having bills sent to collection is a terrible outcome for the people whose finances are then disrupted. It's also a bad outcome for the healthcare system because those bills are almost never collected upon. So it, it shows providers giving care that's not being reimbursed. So, so those are important benefits. But I don't think it should be as surprising as it was to many that Medicaid alone did not cure diabetes or high blood pressure. When people got access to Medicaid, they got access to the health that our healthcare system provides. We also have uncontrolled hypertension in Medicare populations and in the privately insured. And so I think this study doesn't speak to why that is, but in many ways, I think it's representative of our failure to adequately address chronic physical health conditions in our healthcare system today and suggest that we need to have a better system-wide approach to addressing those chronic physical conditions. Yeah, I think that, you know, the answer, just what you're saying, it's like if we've got a broken system, giving people sort of relieving the financial toxicity of the system doesn't necessarily make the system more effective. And there need to be different strategies for that. I wondered on the depression side whether you were thinking that this wasn't because they necessarily got access to mental health services, but like when you relieve the financial strain, when you give people more secure access to healthcare, maybe that's also helping with depression? Or did you think this was because our mental health services are so effective that when you reduced the financial barrier and they got it, that actually that was what produced it? Which did you think it was? I think the latter is very important. So surely people were much happier when they were insured than uninsured. When we did follow up qualitative interviews with people, they described the stress of being uninsured, the psychic burden it placed on them and their families. But I think that we uncovered more than that. I think the clinical episodes of depression dropped substantially, and that's not just about feeling less stressed. People used more medications for depression. They were more likely to have their depression diagnosed by a healthcare provider. And there was huge unmet need in the population for diagnosis and treatment of depression. So the fact that we saw an improvement there, I think, speaks to the removal of financial barriers, getting, allowing people to have access to care, getting medications, and having medications available that worked. Uh, that's always very important. And one of the reasons we studied the conditions we studied is that for each of them, there was some treatment available that could, if taken consistently and prescribed appropriately, improve the condition. So let me come back for a second to hypertension, where there, there was much hand wringing when we discovered that there was no detectable effect on hypertension in this study people suggested, well, maybe you just didn't wait long enough. Well, as you noted, it was about two to two and a half years after people gained access to insurance, they were no more likely to have their high blood pressure diagnosed, and they were no more likely to have a medication in their possession at the two and a half year mark, those who had insurance relative to those who were uninsured. So the idea that somehow if we just waited six more months, somehow that train would have gotten back on the tracks to me doesn't seem quite plausible. And in fact, when people take those medications, they work within a number of months. And so I, I would have expected if we were going to see anything, it would have shown up in that period. But of course, the study stopped after about two and a half years, because more people in Oregon got insurance. So the control group gained access to insurance, and thus the experiment ended. So I cannot say definitively what the effect at five years would be. But uh, not seeing anything at two years does not make me optimistic on that front. But again, people were much better off being insured. They reported their healthcare needs were more likely to be met. They described their health as being better. When you ask people, what's your health? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. People were much more likely to say that their health was good or better. And that's a pretty good um, predictor of people's long-term health outcomes. So the fact that we didn't see the chronic physical conditions improve, to me, doesn't mean that the insurance wasn't providing meaningful health benefits as well as financial and well-being benefits to those who were enrolled. And just to, just to say what you said, I want to just for listeners to know that 
the prevalence of undiagnosed depression being reduced by 50% and untreated depression by more than 60%. That, that, that those are huge numbers. That's not. That's, yes. That's this huge. is the most effective antidepressant ever invented. In fact, <laughs> so, so I, I think there's, we, we don't want to put that aside. And I think sometimes uh, the mental health outcomes are um, made secondary to the physical health outcomes. And, both are very important. Yeah, people's yeah that's amazing. In, in the in the number of respondents reporting unmet mental health needs being unmet dropped by forty percent. That those those are huge numbers. Yeah, Howie, you um, are not afraid to push back against dogma on a number of issues, but one of them that that always catches my eye is the fact that earlier in your career you were involved in a paper that supported the fact that workplace wellness programs help people and later on, you have another natural experiment that sort of disproves that. Um, and I just wonder if you, your thoughts on workplace wellness programs, because like that's almost dogma. There are people that are still to this day saying employers need to invest more in workplace wellness. Yeah, that was a very interesting experience for me. The way that project started is I was you know, sitting with one of my colleagues at Harvard, David Cutler, and one of our then stellar graduate students, Zuri Song, who's now a faculty member at Harvard as well. And David and I were thinking about studying workplace wellness programs because there wasn't a lot of robust evidence about whether they worked or not. And we realized that there was no synthesis of the existing literature we set out first to say, what do we know about these programs? And we realized that there was a lot of scattershot discussion, but we had no place to take away a good overall synthesis estimate. So we got our graduate student, Ben Zuri, to help us pull together a lit review and presented that lit review to say, if you look at all of the published studies, it looks like they work. It looks like there's a return in terms of reduced absenteeism, improved worker well-being. And so this is promising. But as we said in that paper, there may be bias in what studies are done, who participates, what things are published. Very few of these have um, robust identification strategies, meaning teasing out cause and effect. So we we discarded the papers from that review that had no control group or comparison group strategy and left the ones that we thought were the, the best. But we noted that really there was a need for gold standard evidence on whether these worked that was not subject to the kind of selection biases that most natural, you know, quasi-experimental or observational studies were. So then we set about to do that study. Uh, which took many years. We found a wonderful partner in BJ's Wholesale Club and a, a vendor uh, who helped us implement a representative program at scale. And we randomized different stores of BJ's, their employees, into having the program or not and waited to see what the results were. And after two years, and then again, after three years, we found that there were no detectable improvements in those health conditions, in absenteeism, or in spending on healthcare. And of course, the promise to employers is often, you'll save money because you'll have fewer missed shifts and more healthy workers who are more productive for the company. We didn't find any evidence that that was the case. Now, does that mean that those programs are a waste? Well, it depends how much employees like them and whether employers want to have it as a benefit, just like they'd have any other benefit that employees value. But if employers are under the impression that they will save money by implementing one of those programs, this study certainly gave pause to that. And it um, just to bring the question back to where you started, in this case, as in the Medicaid study, it's really important for researchers to hew closely to the findings of the study rather than have their own views and preferences flavor that reporting. And that was particularly fraught in the Medicaid study where I described this nuanced set of findings, some things that uh, would give comfort to those looking to expand and some that would give pause. And policymakers and reporters, journalists would say, okay, so does that mean we should expand Medicaid or not? And the answer is always, well, that depends on what your preferences are. Here are the costs. Here are the benefits. You have to decide if you think that those are worth it. Uh, that is, of course, 
not the answer that a lot of them want. <laughs> but if I want the evidence to be taken seriously, then I have to be an unbiased reporter of that evidence. And I tried very hard throughout to be the voice for the evidence, not the voice for my own views. You know, I think people listening already have a sense of what an extraordinary investigator you are. And the fact that you took on and have taken on questions with great practical significance so that the answers actually have a welcome group of people who want to act on them. And and I think that every time I look at your work, I think like, wow, that's that's just so important to be asking the kind of questions that people care about. But you've decided over the last several years, for sure, you know, to actually, I would say, balance your interest as an investigator with an interest in administration and have gone on to become the dean of the Harris School and now provost of University of Chicago, a real you know, one of the great leaders within academia today. What, what was it that sort of led to that idea that you had that aspiration? I can actually remember when we actually went for a walk, when you were even looking at the Yale School of Public Health uh, years ago. And, uh, you know, what, what, why did you ha why have you had that, that uh, interest? And, and what, have, what, what have you hoped to accomplish in, on the administrative side? Uh, these are deep questions. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it does go back to my original motivation in studying economics in the first place, which is I came to economics from the perspective of public policy. And I was always interested in safety net programs and in using public resources to address challenges in society. And when I took my first economics class, I realized that it was the toolkit that made the most sense to me in thinking carefully about trade-offs, costs and benefits. There are very few policies where everyone's a winner and it's free. And that means you have to both develop estimates that are implementable. How much does it help people? Sure, these people are better off. How many people? How much better off? Because you have to weigh those costs against the benefits to make good policy decisions. So that's what brought me to economics and why I've always tried to study questions that have practical import. But what I realized in some of my stints in government especially is that the evidence doesn't speak for itself. You as a researcher have to take the time and energy to translate them in a way that's meaningful to policymakers. And that doesn't mean overly simplifying things or that people who are digesting the evidence aren't very smart people. They're coming from different backgrounds. And as academics, I think we can get um, a little insular in our jargon, the way we talk in shorthand about our results, and also lose sight of the parts that really matter for policymakers. And the idea that you could just hand off your research to somebody else who would interpret it for you, <laughs> I think is misguided that you as the researcher, if you care about correct interpretation, and if you care about it being accessible in close to real time to people who are trying to make decisions that affect millions of people, you have to invest your own energies in that. For me, the Oregon experiment was the height of that. And after that experience and after having spent some time in Washington, I thought I would really like to have the opportunity to amplify that translational work for a wider set of people. I also really like solving problems in a practical way. And I started as uh, chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at Harvard before becoming dean and then provost. And of course, you have to have big picture vision and goals and priorities, but you also just have to clear away the things that are making it harder for people to do the work they're doing. And there's a real reward to that as well. So I enjoy the mix of getting to think about what's exciting and where we can be investing and supporting and also just unleashing the vast talent of our students and our faculty, both on the transformational educational side and on the the research with real world import side. And that's a feature of my job. I wanna ask, I wanna just read you a quote really quick and then come back to you with a question. In 1993, a Yale undergrad was quoted by the president of Yale at the baccalaureate ceremony. And here's the quote. She said, while here, I have grown enchanted with the idea of a university, not just Yale, but all universities. 
I plan to be in academia for the rest of my life. That is not something I planned before coming to Yale, but something that developed here. I'm going to go to Harvard next year to study economics with an eye on an academic career. My goal is to drift back and forth between academia and policymaking and government to be one of those academics who is called upon to create economic policy and then return to teaching and research. So this is probably the most prescient comment I've ever heard from an undergrad. Um, and I'm wondering now, 30 years later, do you add administration to that? And is, is it in your vision now to be able to see even a larger institution um, or at least a larger mm -hmm. role? And I say this because ironically, President Salovey was our last episode and people are going to think there's a conspiracy theory here. And I just want to Tell them that uh, I think that you would be a great president of a university. Well, well and, and what university, Howie? Well, it starts with a Y, ends in an E, and has an AL in the middle. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You are very kind. I do not know how you dug up that quote. It does sound <laughs> like something I might have said, but I really did come to that realization at Yale. I had no interest in economics. I'd never taken an economics class before uh, I came to the EP&E major at Yale. And I had never thought about academic administration or staying in academia. I was motivated by public policy. But what I learned in my economics classes at Yale that motivated the whole career path that I apparently very clearly laid out the senior year was the value of rigorous thinking about hard problems that you can do in, a, in academia that is very hard to do other places. And then the opportunity that some academics have more than others. I think it, economics is one of the fields that goes back and forth more than some others, but the opportunity to spend some time applying what we've learned in academia to real world decision making, uh, but not be so mired in it that you can't come back to answer new problems, answer new questions. So I, I, it is absolutely true that that was instilled in me at Yale and I'm really glad it worked out the way it did. I'm very much enjoying academic leadership and I've always um, enjoyed leadership opportunities. So I think it's a great combination for me. I wanted to, just as we get to the end here, I wanted to ask you a question as one of the foremost experts on, on health policy in the country, so your very close colleague, Amy Finkelstein, has just come out with a book, We've Got You Covered, in which she makes an argument for, some people would say Medicare for All, I think a little bit differently, but it's like full coverage, you know, for people that we need to move in that direction. And I just wonder where you stand on on this topic. Uh, you know, are, are you, are you all, what are you thinking should be the solution for what ails us? We, you know, we're spending more, we're getting less every year now, particularly in the last decade. Yeah. What, 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 what economics policy should we be considering to address that? I am a huge fan of Amy Finkelstein and her work is uh, flawless in that she's answered so many pressing questions about health policy, public insurance, private insurance, how we think about optimal design definitively. So it's, it was a great pleasure to get to work with her. And unsurprisingly, I think, have come to similar, although slightly different conclusions. And I have some work with John Skinner and Amitabh Chandra and Mark Shepard thinking about optimal insurance design. And I come to something that looks a little more like Medicaid for all than Medicare for all. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I think People ask all the time, is healthcare a right? And to me, that's not the right question because healthcare is not one thing. You, it's not something that you either have or you don't. It's a continuum of things from people going without basic life-saving care to everything under the sun that may have zero incremental benefit to your health at great cost. In fact, some care is actually harmful to health at some point and at great expense. And that's a continuum where we have to choose a spot as a society to say, we think everybody should have at least this much health care. That is a much better question. How much health care is a right than is health care a right? And until we're willing to have that debate as a society, 
we're not going to be able to enact policy that guarantees everyone that minimum floor. If you say the minimum floor is everything that's possibly available, that's more than 100% of GDP. That means no money for schools or housing or food. Nobody would say that. But it's because of the miracle of modern medicine that there is so much that we can do for or to people in the realm of healthcare. So if we have a sensible discussion to say, how much are we going to prioritize health relative to all of the other good things that we can do? and then guarantee that everybody has access to that, and then let higher income people buy more above that if they want to. Now, that last thought is one that comes with serious ethical implications that need serious debate. If you frame it that way, you're in essence saying that higher income people are going to have better health care and live longer, healthier lives. And is that something we're comfortable saying? I would note that that happens now without the minimum access to care that we're talking about and that there is some societal advantage to having higher income people paying more for health care because that's where new treatments come from. And then over time, the cost comes down with good competition and generic entry. And all of that is, of course, crucial uh, so that everybody ends up with access to more treatments and more innovation than they would in a world where there weren't those extra resources being brought into the healthcare system. So so that's something I think we ought to consider more seriously. And I think it's more realistic than an unlimited Medicare for all approach. Now, of course, what's realistic today? I am a simple economist, not a politician, and I find it often baffling what can get done and what can't get done. So if you ask me, do I think we're going to have a plan that looks like this in the next one, two, three, five years? I'm not optimistic about that. But I think if we can change the discourse to focus on how much healthcare we want to be sure everyone has, I think we're in a better position to make sure that we have a sustainable system that delivers that. I want to just, on on behalf of Harlan, but also with Harlan, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. You bring clarity to so many topics, many more than we got to discuss today, but I just thank you for all that you've done for the profession um, and look forward to, to seeing more of your work. Yeah, what a great pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. I'm grateful for the chance to talk with you and I'd love to come back anytime. Well, Howie, that was a a terrific interview, uh, but hey, let's get to your part this week. So what's on your mind? Yeah, so I just wanted to come to, with something that's, to me, a little uplifting in a sense. The president's emergency plan for AIDS release, which we call PEPFAR, is a 20-year-old program first created by President George W. Bush in 2003, reauthorized three times. It has always had widely bipartisan support. Estimates are that it has saved 25 million lives globally, increased vaccination rates, decreased childhood and maternal mortality rates, had other positive effects on health and health care, including uh, about infectious diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. It has cost over $100 billion over its history, but it is widely regarded as one of the most impactful and successful global health initiatives ever. And in the context of 25 million lives saved alone, This sum is actually modest, $4,000 per life, if you wanted to try to quantify that. Rare have we seen interventions that are that cost effective. So Congress, which right now is, as we speak, so dysfunctional as to be almost paralyzed, was already holding up this successful program because of abortion politics. In short, Congress would like to legislate that any organization that performs or promotes abortion as a means of family planning should not receive PEPFAR funds. There's no question that PEPFAR neither supports nor funds abortion. This is about using the leverage of U.S. funding to prevent non-governmental organizations in other countries from performing or promoting abortion. President Trump had banned uh, this use of the money. President Biden undid that by a separate executive order. And I would just point out, to put a little different way, we are imposing on other countries a standard that we ourselves don't adhere to. And I really hope that cooler heads will prevail because the the, the bipartisan support has been something that we've pointed to with pride. The number of lives saved has been great. 
Did you say cooler heads will prevail in our Congress? Is that, well, they really can't get that? hotter. Can they get hotter? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, PEPFAR is one of the most uh, amazing programs that has ever been put into place. Uh, I know many of us, you know, didn't always agree with George W. Bush on some things. I know other people did agree, but this is one thing I think everyone can come together and say was a real triumph. Uh, someone who I knew through my residency, Eric Goosby, was uh, head of PEPFAR from 2009 to 2013. And Eric, who's a remarkable guy, really transitioned it from this emergency response to a sustainable program. But, you know, th it's got an illustrious history and, and much more work to do. It's a tragedy to not continue it. And it, for people interested in diplomacy, isn't this, Howie, like a perfect example of soft power? That's right. Where it's not like we go in with troops, but we actually go in with help. And, uh, 100 percent, Harlan. I mean, we talk about, you know, giving governments money for weapons, munitions, which may very well serve our national interest. But here is something that we can do to save lives, make people's lives better. And to your point earlier, when we in the, in the beginning of the podcast, you look at South Africa as an example of what life expectancy is. It bottomed out around 2003, 2004, when PEPFAR started. And since that time, we've seen an improvement. A lot of it just has to do with the medications. A lot of it has to do with PEPFAR. Yeah, I love when we exert our soft power like that. I really wish we would do more of this around the world. And uh, yeah, this is not a time to pull back on, on that kind of work. Thank you, Howie, for bringing that up. It's just such an important point. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Kromoltz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can continue to follow us on Twitter or X or email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. On X, I'm at H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. That's H-M-K Yale. And I'm at the Howie at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. -E. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track, founder of the MBA for executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs. You can check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management and the Yale School of Public Health. Thanks to our researchers, Inez Giel and Sophia Stone, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Amazing work week in, week out. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.